the program that you're attending today is called Meet a Nose. Uh, Harold, welcome. <laughs> I'm really glad to have you here. Uh, and let me just sort of share, share your bio, your brief bio. So Harold McGee has written primarily about the science of food and cooking. He is the author of the award-winning classic on food and cooking, the science and lore of the kitchen, as well as keys to good cooking and guide to making the best foods and recipes. Uh, he is a former columnist for the New York Times and has been named Food Writer of the Year by Bon Appetit magazine and to the Time 100, an annual list of the world's most influential people. Since 2010, Mickey has been a visiting lecturer in Harvard University's course Science and Cooking from Haute Cuisine to Soft Matter Science. He lives in San Francisco. And of course, more information about Harold can be found at CuriousCook.com. So I want to start uh, at the beginning. Originally, your, your plan was to study um, as astronomy at Caltech, after which you moved to literature, eventually getting a PhD on the romantic poetry of John Keats at Yale. So there's this sort of a heavy science and then this move towards literature. Can you explain that a little bit, sort of what moved you away from astronomy and into this more soft science, I guess, of, of literature? <laughs> Well, yeah, so I, um, I grew up fascinated by the skies. And uh, when I was old enough to begin to read about the skies, I was amazed to learn about the universe, you know, cosmology, what's out there, how it might have all begun and that kind of thing. So I was just fascinated by it. My father had gone to Caltech. And so on the coffee table, there were alumni magazines with pictures of the Mount Wilson Observatory, Mount Palomar, so of course, I, my, I was fated <laughs> to go there. Totally. Uh, when I got there and found out what astronomy in the 20th century was, and still is in the 21st century, um, it became less, uh, it, it resonated less with me because what it meant was uh, not actually looking through telescopes and having dreamy thoughts about the universe. It was you know, data crunching and uh -huh. using the, uh, the campus computer system, which was, you know, relatively new back then. This is the late 60s. Uh, you had to wait in line for an appointment to be able to use the computer. It was just, a, you know, didn't have much to do with my childhood staring at the heavens. <laughs> yeah. So I, I realized I, I still loved being there because I was learning all kinds of amazing stuff, but I it, it wasn't, uh, as I say, resonating with me and my sense of what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. What I realized was that I was really more interested in the feelings that thinking about these things evoked in me, uh, rather than the details of the, you know, the, the, the math and physics. So I ended up staying at Caltech. Uh, the people there in the humanities department actually encouraged me to stay. I wanted to transfer, but they said, you came to study science for a reason. So stay here, get a good science education, and we'll give you tutorials in literature because we don't wow. have that many students. Wow. So I was able to, to, to work as a research assistant at the Huntington Library. Love which it. Was an amazing. <laughs> amazing experience. place. It's a resource for the world, that place. I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, one of the perks was um, being able to uh, walk in the gardens before they opened to the general public. Oh, wow. And so I could get there early in the morning and kind of wander through the, you know, the early morning mists of, uh, uh, of Altadena and the smells were amazing. The views were amazing. It was, uh, and then to go into the library and smell the, the old books. Old books, <laughs> totally. So I, I stayed at Caltech, got my, uh, my mongrel bachelor of science degree in literature. I, I think you're the only person I've ever heard of in the world who got a literature degree at Caltech. It's amazing. It's like a well, real. <laughs> there, there are a couple of us, but okay, but yeah, not many. Not yeah. many. Um, anyway, then I went to graduate school to uh, study poetry and wrote a dissertation about John Keats, and um, wanted to teach and did for a few years, but I could never land a tenure track position. Mm. And after a few years of trying and coming close, but not quite getting it, I began to think about alternatives. And mm. my, my mentors at the university said, you know, you have the science in your background, you should be doing something with that, because that's was a big part of your life then and you could make it a big part again. 
So long story short, I ended up thinking about writing about the science of everyday life. Mm -hmm. So of course, my first thought was cosmology, but you know, Stephen Hawking had that covered. Pretty oh, well, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, no reason to think about that. Uh, so um, uh, I ended up um, discovering that uh, food and drink, which my friends and I were all very interested in, and uh, would get together for potlucks and so on, was something that had some interesting science behind it, and no one had really written about that. And I, I went to the library one day and discovered the, uh, the TX section, um, which is food science and technology. And I spent a couple hours just kind of pouring through the the journals, poultry science, and, you know, I just thought it would be really fun to share that kind of information with people, my friends, first of all, uh, but then uh, a wider public. And I found a publisher who thought it was a good idea. And so I got a contract to quit my teaching job and, and uh, write a book about the science of cooking. And this was in the late 70s. And um, a very different world back then. Wasn't as easy to write books back then because you actually had to go to the library and... <laughs> uh, you know, look up the journals and look at the index volumes and then go look at the actual volume in which the article appeared. They're completely different and typing up the manuscript on a manual typewriter. So I, I wrote a book about the science of food and cooking and it went nowhere for a couple of years uh, because it was uh, an unusual approach at the time until uh, Mimi Sheraton, uh, who's a food critic in New York, uh, wrote a piece about it for Time magazine. Mm -hmm. Then people began to hear about it. And I started to get uh, letters back in those days from, um, from young people in culinary school who were trying to learn why things work the way they do. And their, their teachers who were uh, old style chefs who just learned by doing Mm. Um, had no answers for them and actually uh, actively discouraged them from asking questions because that's just not what you do in a kitchen. You just get mm. things done. Mm. So I started to hear from the kind of up, up and coming generation of American cooks and, um, and was lucky to catch the wave of interest in food and cooking and drinks and coffee and all these things that really began to emerge in the 80s. And um, I ended up being able to make a living <laughs> writing about the science of cooking, which was not evident at the beginning. That's amazing. And, and, uh, and I have to say, when I was researching you a little bit, I, I came across this article that you wrote for, for Nature about um, the, wait, 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 let me find it. The science of whipping egg whites in copper bowls, which I thought was just delightfully specific, you know, like. We, we did that for fun, uh, basically. We didn't really expect the journal to accept the article, but we decided to write one kind of tongue in cheek and send it to them. And just as you say, you know, there it's a journal with a reputation for heavy subjects. And yeah. one of the reviews came back and said, the science looks fine, but the subject is fluffy. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so was that before or after you wrote, that's after you wrote on, on, on food and cooking, is that right? Well, actually, I, I did the research as I was writing on food and cooking. And then mm -hmm. when I finished writing the book, then I had time to put together an article right. with a couple of scientists who actually had the machinery to do some serious experiments. And, and then we had fun putting it all together. I know very little about the world of food, so I'm going to show my ignorance. So forgive me if it's a stupid question, but th this sort of molecular gastronomy that started becoming, at least in my world, very, you know, filtered to me, which is something. Is this something that you feel was was part of this wave that you were in, this, this sort of attention to the science of it and to the how it's done? Well, kind of. Um, I, I think that actually um, had more to do with the, the sort of uh, prestige that cooks began to develop in right. the 80s, 90s with food television right. and the glossy magazines. And um, it just became a much more, uh, a much more interesting thing for people to be doing. And then when chefs became famous, then they started to look for ways to distinguish themselves. Right. And one way to do that is to be 
to, to do your own food, you know, to be creative and to be recognized as a, a creator of a particular style. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think, where uh, chefs realize that science is a, is a real ally in uh, work like that, because it's important to know, you know, what your materials are and how they behave and that kind of thing helps you think of possibilities that you wouldn't have thought of otherwise. So I think the science came in secondarily to this wave of interest in being creative. It's interesting because as you're talking about that, I'm, I'm seeing the parallel to the world of perfume where, you know, 10 years ago, no one knew who the noses were, per, you know, necessarily. And now suddenly there is a lot of attention being paid to the, to the makers. And, you know, so, I mean, it seems like you're, you're, you're now on another wave, you know, that, that relates with your, with your write about scent, your writing about scent. So. Yeah. Do you, do you see the parallels? Yeah, no, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I, uh, I in turn know much less about the world of scent and the sort of the history of, um, of perf perfumery. So, but, but what you say is, makes sense to me that, um, you know, a, a craft will kind of be going along in the background and then all of a sudden the light gets shown on it. And then, totally. yeah, uh, people begin to think more about their their image how, how yeah. they look with that light <laughs> so how did you get into scent as a topic uh for writing so so the context for this everybody is that there's a book that just came out called nosedive a field guide to the world's smells so point being Harold is turning his attention specifically to scent so so how did you come to this what what led you to decide to spend that energy on, on scent that you've been spending on food well, uh, it actually did start with food. So <clears throat> I, I thought in around 2010 that I wanted to write a book about flavor, which is you know what, what makes food interesting and delicious and memorable and all that kind of thing. Uh, and for a long time, when I started writing in the 70s, we really didn't know much about flavor, you know, uh, either about what's in food and drink to stimulate our senses or how our senses work to, to take that information in. By 2010, we learned a lot and the Nobel Prize had been given for um, uh, the discovery of the olfactory receptors. Right. So I thought, okay, now's the time to, to dive into this. Um, what happened was that um, as I looked at it more carefully, I thought, uh, first of all, we'd learned so much that it would really not be possible to do justice both to what's out there objectively to be uh, sensed, you know, the, the stuff that's in food and drink that gives us the pleasure, and uh, in the same book to cover what's going on in us as we experience those things. Right. And the, the ex experience side of it is fascinating and complicated, uh, but I think practically speaking, it boils down to you never know what you're gonna experience <laughs> because we all have different sets of olfactory receptors and taste receptors. Um, we all have different experiences. And so we have different databases in our brains that are called upon to make sense of what it is that we experience. So I thought that going into detail about that would, would maybe not be um, productive. Mm. <laughs> and so I would take the time and space to spend uh, uh, looking only at what's out there to be experienced, the stuff that stimulates our sense of taste and smell and gives us the impression of flavor. Mm. The closer I looked at that, I thought, well, you know, taste is um, is important, but it's only a, a between a half dozen and a dozen different sensations. It's really uh, aroma that gives us the tremendous variety of different flavors. And so maybe I'll begin to focus on aroma. Uh, and then it, I, I began to wonder why it is uh, that the aromas of particular foods echo each other. So for example, Parmesan cheese, which is, you know, year and a half old cow's milk, can sometimes smell like a ripe pineapple, oh. like a fruit. So why is that? How does that work? Um, uh, you know, borage flowers can smell like oysters. Uh, tea can taste or smell like seaweed. So I began to wonder, first of all, why these echoes? Um, and then why in particular the echoes of things that are not even edible, but you know, part, parts of the rest of the world. 
uh, like the ocean, like the forest, like flowers. I mean, we eat some flowers, but um, we like flowers for their own for their own reasons. Mm. So I, I ended up then thinking, okay, maybe what I need to do is write about um, the smells of the world. You know, why mm. do things in the world, food and drink included, have the smells they do? Uh, what are smells? What are those molecules doing there? And that kind of thing. And because I was a, an astronomy major <laughs> once upon a time, it occurred to me to start with the Big Bang. <laughs> well, start at the beginning, huh? <laughs> right, right, yeah. And, uh, and ask, you know, if you were the, the cosmic chef and you, uh, you know, put the, the pot on to boil at the Big Bang and started cooking up the universe, at what stage in the history of the universe would you begin to recognize things that we know on Earth today? Um, and it turns out that the answer is very, very early in the history of the universe. Uh, you, you can get uh, molecules that smell like vinegar and ammonia and eggs and even fruits in, in outer space. They've been detected by, by radio astronomers out there. That, that kind of set the context for me. Okay, I, I really want to understand this whole picture. So I ended up writing a book in which the last two chapters are about food. <laughs> food and drink. And the first 17 chapters are about other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, fragrance, uh, fragrances, perfumes, uh, incense, and so on included. One thing that I really enjoyed was you, 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 you bring this, you know, chemical knowledge, for instance, you have chemical compositions for things. You, you list all the molecules that are in it, guaiacol, ethyl guaiacol, cresol, carbonine, et cetera. But then you also really get into the history, you know, so there's this really cool two-part approach to, to, to smell, to, to smelling, which I feel is very appropriate to the topic, you know. Um, well, and in the case of the fragrance chapter in particular, that's largely the result of my conversations with Mandy, writing about the smells of the cosmos or about, um, uh, you know, uh, confined animal facilities or, yeah. uh, or industrial chemicals, that kind of thing. That, that's, you know, the one thing. But when it came to fragrance, perfume, and so on, Mandy's right across the bay from me, and I met her, uh, gosh, it must be 15 years ago or something like that, and uh, have learned much of what I've learned about fragrances from her, spending time with her. And uh, so a lot of the, the, um, uh, the history of the development of the fragrance world uh, that I got into the book really had to do with my trying to understand the place of naturals, the place of synthetics, how the, the fragrance world that we know today came to be and how to kind of navigate it and make sense of it. Because I'm, I'm a novice, you know, to me, it's, um, it's all amazing and interesting and uh, almost everything I take a whiff of is, is news to me. Uh, so I wanted to make sense of it and help other people make sense of it so that they too could kind of dive into that world and, and appreciate it for the amazing world it is. Yeah, it's interesting because I am struck to the parallel between uh, sort of how, how we talk about perfume also and sort of your earlier studies of romantic poetry, you know, with this tragic young poet who died at what, 25 of, you know, and this sort of sadness of, of the romantic poetry and then the sort of potential sadness of perfumery too. There's a sadness to it, you know, there's the sort of evanescent disappearance that... I'm just I'm just banging on now, but anyway. <laughs> well, no, 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 because I think Keats, um, you know, actually my my dissertation was titled Keats and the Progress of Taste, which had to do with aesthetic taste, of course. Right. You know, if you're going to set out to be a poet, how do you choose your subject matter? And that's determined by what counts as you know significant subject matter in your time. So that was the subject, but you know, he is this, uh, I think of all the romantics, the, the most down to earth, uh, sensuous poet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just reading the other day because it's the, it's the season, the, the, his sonnet to autumn, mm -hmm. which is just all about the, the smells and the, you know, the, the, the tastes of uh, honey and cider and, Things like that. So um, I, I, I think there's a lot there, you know, the, to, to um, 
notice the beauty of the of the natural world as it's given to us and as we will often just kind of ignore because it's it's there and yeah. kind of it's our world and it, it kind of uh, it's like it's sort of adapting to ascent you know if it's around you all the time you begin to uh to forget that it's there and to forget how amazing it is yeah yeah well on, on that topic actually one of the things i enjoyed in in the chapter of your book also is there's a very down-to-earth approach to it and you you talk uh quite a bit uh about um tobacco cannabis and, and mocha or moxa i'm not sure how to pronounce it and 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 actually something that really stuck you call tobacco uh, our modern secular incense i i thought it was really cool that you really acknowledged their their import you know in culture so um, yeah, and, and tobacco is, I mean, this, one of the, I, I just learned so much writing this book. That's why it took me 10 years. I had a lot to learn. That's a long, <laughs> but, that's a long uh, research. <laughs> but uh, tobacco is especially interesting because I really had no idea how complex it, uh, a process it is to make tobacco and how many different versions of that process there are, the, the different results you get from them. Uh, it's, it, it really is remarkable. And, uh, and you don't, in fact, smoking is kind of the, the last thing you would need to consider when enjoying tobacco. I, uh, you know, started to buy samples and get them in and just smell them on their own or put them on, you know, one of these little vaporizers where you can control the temperature. And um, uh, so you just heat it up so that you can get the, the aromatics. Once, once you begin to, once you light a cigarette or a cigar or pipe tobacco, um, then in addition to the smells of the tobacco itself, of course, you're getting all these combustion products. And to me, the most interesting thing is what's, what's in there before it burns up. Mm. <laughs> and that's yeah. something that, that you can enjoy without... Uh, without in, indulging in the, the harmful aspects of smoking. And you say it in your book. I mean, you talk about how um, there's like, I think there's scatol or something, one of those horrific molecules in the burnt tobacco. Yeah. What is moxa or mocha? Uh, moxa is, it's a, um, a Chinese herbal preparation that you burn in order to kind of cleanse yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, um, you know, a particular set of herbs that, uh, that they tend to use. It's uh, analogous to smudging in, uh, in North America, you know, the burning Native Americans burning of- Oh yeah, of, of course, sage, sage. And, yeah, 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 and whatnot, yeah. 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 Are there any other traditions like that that you, that you found, I mean, historically with, with, I mean, I suppose there's a tradition like that in every culture, huh? Burning aromatics for- Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does seem to be a, a very, um, you know, if, if you have plants and if you have fire- <laughs> Yeah, things are going to get burned. <laughs> that, hmm, this smells really good and <laughs> let's, let's, let's do that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, Rachel Ann Redding in the comments mentions that uh, their, their grandfather was a tobacco farmer who never smoked a day in his life, which I think is pretty, pretty beautiful, actually. I wish he'd had a chance to know what he was missing. Um, and Jocelyn, you mentioned mugwort. I'm not sure. Um, is, that, is that in reference to, to moxa? Well, yeah, it was yeah. in reference to moxa bastion. Moxa bastion. I think it's um, Artemisia vulgaris. Yes. Which okay. is museum. Yeah on acupressure points um, when they're doing acupuncture. Is that the same that you were talking about before? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tara? Yeah. Um, so, so, okay. So, so it took you 10 years to write this book, uh, which is a considerable amount of time and it's, it's now been released. It took a long time and the, the actual production process was not easy uh, just for a variety of reasons. Um, it's, as you mentioned, got charts in it. It's got uh, illustrations. Um, uh, these are difficult times for people to be communicating with each other about details. And so, yeah, yeah the last few months have been pretty intense. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it actually feels great <laughs> because <laughs> uh, of those 10 years, I was overdue on my contract by seven. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so... For seven years, I felt bad because oh I'm... <laughs> no, what a, what a lot of pressure to carry around for seven years! My God, yeah. <laughs> so that that's a, a huge relief. I'm I, I feel yeah, uh, light as air. Uh, you talk about listening to smells. 
Um, and, and it's a really, it's a nice concept. Well, that's uh, something I, I latched on to, uh, thanks to another uh, Bay Area uh, person, Liza Dalby, uh, who's written a number of books about Japanese culture. And um, she mentioned to me, uh, and I read in her books about this um, uh, incense practice called Monko, Monko. which uh, for which the best translation in English is listening to smells which sounds uh, at, at first, uh, as you say, synesthetic or just odd. Um, but it's the distinction between hearing something and listening to something. You know, you hear something, it's just in the air around you. You listen, you're paying attention. You're, you're attending to it and getting uh, understanding information from it. Uh, and so it's that because we don't have a lot of good words around smell. Uh, in fact, the English language is, is no help at all, <laughs> really, in understanding the nuances. We don't have a, a version of listening for mm -hmm. smelling. We just smell things. Um, and so I just I really like that idea of uh, using the, the word listening just to, uh, to point out the fact that it's something that we're uh, perfectly used to doing with hearing, with um, voices and music and things like that, we pay attention. Yeah. With smells, not so much. And so listening to smells, I think, is a nice way to capture that idea of just paying attention. Yeah, it's, it's funny. You mentioned that, and I think about it, and I realize, yeah, you're completely right. There is no word for sort of conscious. It's sort of about a, like a consciousness, isn't it? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, really letting it register and then and letting your your uh, your brain you know work on it you know search for echoes and parallels and uh, you know wonder why and uh, just do something with it rather than just register it and move on to yeah. something else yeah I wonder if that's just because we're so I mean because you know obviously our, our culture we don't value smell you know at least in I should say in, in North America you know I don't want to speak for everybody on this call but um, yeah, there, it must have to do with that, don't you think, that we're just sort of not taught to think or, or engage with smell really beyond just like, yeah, or ill, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and I think there are good um, sort of biological reasons for that to be sort of the, the default mm. <laughs> when it comes to smell. Uh, but, you know, we're, uh, we're human beings. We, we go beyond the default for the things that nature gave us and, and you know, really find out what, uh, what, what we can do with them and, and what they can give us in life. And so I, I, I think smell is ripe for that kind of a exploration in the West. Yeah. Do you have a practice? Do you have a smell practice? Uh, you know, where, I mean, like a, a mindfulness practice with smell? Or? Not so much a, a regular practice. I just mm. do try to notice as much as I can. So, yeah. uh, uh, and sometimes, you know, li like everyone, I'm in the midst of doing something else. And so I, I just don't have the, the uh, bandwidth to do it. But um, whenever I can, I try to, uh, you know, if I'm going for a walk and I see a plant I don't know, I'll take a little leaf and crush it and sniff it and yeah. see if it's interesting, that kind of thing. So folks, if there's any questions for Harold, please do chime in. Um, I'm gonna carry on talking to him, but I just wanna make sure you have an opportunity to say hi. And actually on that note, Mandy and Foster, are you ready to, can I, can I, can I unmute you to say hi? It's so <laughs> nice to hear you talking about the book. I learned stuff I didn't know before, just listening to you talk about it. So it's really nice to hear you, the presentation. I, I have read the whole book. Actually, both of us have read every word of this book because we were the readers for the book and um and foster is a marvel in grammar so he was really in in there on every comma and every semicolon dash but the book i can say more about it because the book is incredible um it's it just really um puts you in touch with how wondrous the world is in terms of smell and how interconnected things are all the way like from outer space into your life that you're living right now and broken down into molecules which things have these molecules in common what they smell like in a very clear way because i'm a, a science phobe to put it mildly i mean i took chemistry and 
high school and I got a D and that was only because I had a tutor and I think they, they felt sorry for me. I'm terrible at chemistry, but Harold really makes it completely interesting and useful in your life and particularly in your life being in the world, cooking and being in nature. It makes your whole experience so much richer to learn the stuff that Harold has to say about it. So it's really, uh, couldn't recommend it enough. Uh, what the work that he's done. All right, so a little happy. shout out. We're happy for him, and boy, yeah, are we all. glad it's done. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like you've you've seen it. You've seen it through all the processes. Mandy and Foster uh, did, uh, you know, way more went way beyond the call of friendship. <laughs> In, uh, in reading, making suggestions, finding mistakes, uh, uh, you know, above and beyond everything I learned from Mandy about, um, about fragrance. So, yeah. I'm very grateful. And I loved all the time we had together talking about smells or we get little bottles. I'd have, you know, the 80 million essences I have. Harold would sometimes get them like Skatol that you could only get really funky, funkadelic. Uh, synthetics and I'd come over and smell them and we would have a really good time just smelling everything and talking about it. Harold has a vanilla plant of which I have one bean in my museum and he was pollinating, I saw him pollinating them with a toothpick. Oh wow. wow. It, it was just it was just fun to share that world. The world of smells is so in a way unshareable. It was really fun to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, actually, that brings me to a, to a question. So, so Mandy, thank you, thank you for triggering a question. So, yeah, it is unsmellable, and it's it's also very difficult to talk about. So, I mean, we, so you can go, you know, poetic, or you can go chemical, but but one is a little can be a little intangible, and one can be completely alien to people. So, so Harold, I'm curious, you know, um, how do you engage with that 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 very difficult act of communicating something that's so hard to communicate, you know? Yeah, no, that was a, a huge challenge and um, I'm, I'm not sure how well I did at it, um, but I, I made a couple of decisions. One was, I mean, there are uh, lists of molecules in the book as, as Mandy mentioned. Um, and that's because I wanted to make sure that people realize that, um, that we know in detail what's out there that that we're smelling and it's not a matter of you know like a uh, like a wine experts tasting notes with you know uh, bramble berries and uh, this and that and the other thing which are uh, subjective uh, impressions from someone who has a particular database of uh, of experiences to compare the experience with so these, uh, the, the reason the molecules are in there is to indicate that these are real objective materials that are responsible for our experience of these things. Um, I don't want people to get um, um, uh, put off or you know, worried about those things. So they're always uh, to the far right of the little tables that I include. So you can ignore them if you want to. But then what, then what uh, I did was indicate the, the component smells in the overall smell that those individual molecules are responsible for. And that's something that everyone in the perfume world knows and lots of people in the rest of the world have no idea about the fact right. that the smells are more like chords than like notes. And so um, uh, I, I point out the, the uh, aroma notes that the individual molecules are responsible for that go into the overall smell. Um, but then when it comes to describing what those notes are like, I really have to fall back on, um, uh, well, the, the tradition of calling those kinds of smells by the names that we've come to call them by. Mm. And usually they have to do with associations. You know, it's mm -hmm. uh, octanol smells like mushrooms because even though it's in lots of different things, it's it's dominant in mushrooms, and so that's what we associate it with. Um, and sometimes I'll I'll kind of switch it up between chapters because you know it's, it's not useful, for example, to say that butyric acid can smell uh, like butter 
if you're describing the smell of butter. So it depends on the context. Um, and I tried to kind of, you know, duck and weave with the context and, you know, do the best job I could, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge and, and um, uh, imperfect. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, isn't all communication imperfect? You know, I think I, I think it's a it's an amazing challenge. I think to try to to try to write about scent. You know, Priya, do do you, you had a question and and um, now oh there you are. Would you like to ask it? Hi. Yeah. Um. Uh. This is just very exciting. I I um just wanted to thank uh, Carl McGee for you brought so much to my life. Like actually uh, I read um, on food and cooking when I was in college in the course of like a kitchen chemistry class at MIT. And it, honestly, like I had been really into food and cooking before then. And it just like, it really oriented me to a particular approach. And, um, and it really shaped me as I kind of carried that towards like making body care and then becoming a natural perfumer as well. So I'm so, it's so exciting to kind of like I, I didn't know about your book until a week ago. And I'm like, my God, this is, I cannot wait to read it. Um, um, but the question that I wanted to ask is um, that I um, I find that there are, I, I'm curious if you have um, sort of household chemicals and laundry detergents and stuff like that um, in the book, if you talk about that, because I personally find that to be like a very, um, dominant aspect of the scent landscape of our world that just sort of lands and sticks in everything. Like you enter in a, into a bus, no one's there and you still smell it because it just, it sits there and it sits in the fabrics and the plastics and stuff and then emanates out. And I've, I've been really curious about that but I haven't ever been able to actually like research the chemistry of it but I'm super curious about it and I would love to hear anything you have to say about that? Well, uh, so there are um, uh, maybe three or four paragraphs uh, about that kind of thing um, to do mainly with um, the, the kinds of materials that end up in products like those and, and their ubiquity um, and the problems that that can cause um, for, for all kinds of reasons. Um, but it's... Um, yeah, it's true that, uh, I mean, walking down the street, you pass somebody's uh, dryer vent and you smell the same smell that you'd smell if you're going to the mall and walking around, you know, the department store has, has uh, air coming out of it that smells almost exactly the same. So yeah, these, uh, these artificial musks are just everywhere. And as you say, they cling to everything. And uh, they're, they're an environmental problem because they're manufactured by the ton, I discovered. And, uh, and they don't, a lot of them don't biodegrade. So they just accumulate in, uh, in wastewaters. So yeah, that's, uh, I, I don't really go into, um, you know, particular products. Uh, you know, detergents and, and uh, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, but I just talk, talk in those kinds of general terms about the things that people have used, why they use them, and the, the, the sorts of problems that they can present. You talked about these, these musks that are sort of in, in the mall and in dryer things and whatnot. And, and it sort of triggered this thought that like we, we are living through a sort of olfactory sameness, you know? these days where, where these scents are being sort of sold multinationally. That, so I don't know if there's any thoughts about, about sort of how to counterbalance that or if that's, you know, I don't know, something that, I don't even know if there's a question there, it's more maybe an observation, but. Yeah, no, it's, it's an interesting observation and it, um, uh, you know, the, the way to get around it, if it's going to be gotten around, uh, I think is going to be individually and just by being aware that that's what's going on. I mean, that's part of part of listening, right? Is to notice that you're hearing the same boring tune <laughs> in these like different music, yeah. environments. Yeah, that's right. Olfactory music. On the other hand, um, a thought that that crossed my mind when you when you put it that way is that um, uh, you know there are. Uh, probably uh, many cultures in which there is just a, a kind of um, standard incense, for example, so that uh, day in and day out, 
maybe slightly differently for different occasions, but you know there there is a, a kind of olfactory sameness of a different sort. You know, it's not industrial and it's not a single molecule and it's probably not as synthetic, but um, there is a, a, a kind of um, theme, an olfactory theme to the air of uh, probably many different places. So, you know, making uh, distinctions um, about that, uh, first of all, describing those kinds of samenesses and making distinctions among them and, you know, the, the reasons for them and so on. I mean, it's uh, but sameness can be comforting and, you know, reassuring and mark a, a, a place as being yours on the one hand, or it can be just this, you know, byproduct of um, what's the cheapest thing to make that lasts the longest. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point. I, I It reminds me of, I, I subscribe to this Lapham's Quarterly. I don't know if you're familiar. It's this amazing yeah. publication. Yeah, I love it. And one time they had a, they had an issue about, I guess it was about the, the desire to flee, the need for other places or whatever the word would be. And they had a poem from this young kid in like ancient, ancient Egypt, where he was talking about being stuck in the same old, same old of his everyday life and looking up to, you know, whatever city, Memphis or something that he was, and, and it really struck me, but this human sort of uh, bemoaning of our state is time, is timeless, you know, so maybe, maybe <laughs> some, some, some person with this incense that they're using all the time is bemoaning the same thing, the olfactory sameness of their environment, so uh, it's a nice way of spinning it. Uh, Michael McGee says that uh, they liked your coverage of new car smell. Uh, it's in the chapter about uh, basically about uh, fire and pet petrochemicals, uh, which I treat as sort of the afterlife of organic materials, you know, uh, after plants and animals have, uh, have lived and died. Uh, they can either, you know, be turned into compost for the next generation, or they can go up and smoke, or they can be buried a few miles below the surface and get turned into petrochemicals, which we then use for, for all kinds of things. And uh, so the, the uh, new car smell, I, I wrote about largely because it, it's, uh, you know, a new car, uh, closed up with the windows closed, sitting in the sun, all these uh, solvents and so on get baked out of the, the fake fabric uh, or even real fabric that's been treated with solvents and the plastics and the vinyl and the you know, floor mats and all that kind of thing. So you end up with this miasma of uh, um, petrochemicals, which are, are thick enough, in fact, that they'll leave a film on the surface of the window. You know, you if you leave your new car in the sun for a couple of days and come out, there's this gunk on the inside, which are all the volatiles that have um, condensed on the on the window. So it's a way to get a kind of um, uh, you know a, an epiphany of <laughs> modern modern industrial chemistry all in one uh, one tight little spot. Mm -hmm. Now the thing is that people have it, it's been an interesting evolution. So for a while. Nobody really cared about the fact that these were uh, probably toxic. So people loved the smell of, of new cars because it was new, you know, and it didn't smell like uh, people had been driving around in it for decades. Um, then we realized that, in fact, it's not such a good thing to be breathing that kind of stuff. And so manufacturers began to find ways to reduce the, the, the levels of these uh, compounds in, in new car air, but that took away the new car smell. So they began to formulate fragrances that they could spray in there to replace the, the, that new car smell. And so now we have um, artificial, an artificial version of the petrochemical version of new car smell. Um, I, I've heard similar about leather. I don't know if you've done any research on that. Where is, is that the case? Yeah, leather is a really interesting material. Uh, you know, it, it has to be very heavily processed, either with um, you know things like uh, dung and urine back in the old days when those were the main reagents that people had to work with, or uh, in modern times with you know very specific acids and alkalis and metals and things like that. 
So it's this matrix that contains all kinds of gunk that are left over from the processing. And some of that gunk can smell really good. Um, so, uh, but it's, it is gunk, you know, it's, it's left processing materials left over in the, in the structure of the, the leather itself. Uh, and again, something that is a, an acquired smell, you know, you can, you can enjoy the, the old fashioned version, you can enjoy the, the modern version, you can enjoy uh, leather that's been um, treated with, um, with tar to waterproof it, you know, Russian, uh, the Russian version. So yeah, all, all kinds of possibilities. Uh, so Anne asks, just as some of us might be missing some taste sensors, making it difficult to enjoy some foods, is that because we are also unable to smell the scent compounds connected to those tastes? Yeah, so this uh, this is a, an example of how English just is not uh, friendly to our understanding <laughs> how our senses work. So uh, when it comes to the flavor of a food, setting aside texture and, you know, um, uh, spiciness, that kind of thing. It comes down to taste plus smell. Taste on the tongue and smell in the nose. And we have two different sets of receptors for those two different uh, senses. And we all have different uh, repertoires um, of, of those two sets. So we all, when we're tasting something or, or sniffing something, we're all having a slightly different experience, sometimes a, a majorly different experience. And it does have to do with the set of receptors that you happen to have inherited your, uh, from your parents. Um, so taste is, is only a half dozen to a dozen different sensations, sweet, sour, salt, bitter, savory, things like that. Smell is where you get all the, the variety. And uh, that's where you, uh, where, um, uh, losses or, or absences of particular receptors are more apparent because most of us have intact um, taste receptors for the most part. There are, there are lots of different bitter receptors and some of us have um, uh, more of those than others do. And so we're more sensitive, for example, to the bitterness of uh, vegetables in the cabbage family part of the reason that some people just can't stand them and other people love them. Um, but most of the variation is in the olfactory receptors. We have about 400 of them. And, um, you know, we're, um, I, I think it's something like uh, between 10 and 30% of them in, an, in a given individual uh, are not there or they're wow. not, not functional. Wow. So it, it just depends on what we, what we ended up with. Are they different ones that are non-functional in different individuals or, or sort of the same ones that repeat over and over? No, it's exactly uh, the, that it's different for different individuals. Oh, right, right, right. So, so yeah. wow. So we could be having a completely different experience of a given smell, for instance. Yeah. And yeah. not only, of course, at the receptor level, but once the receptors um, signal to the brain that they've detected something, then the brain has to make sense of that. And we've all got really different brains. And uh, so a lot happens up there that uh, is gonna be different person to person. And then just a comment from Jocelyn. Uh, Jocelyn in Australia, hey Jocelyn. Enjoyed your book on food so much, thank you. Uh, Manetta says, truly fascinating, Harold. You've given so much to think about in terms of the pros and cons of novelty and scent. And then Don says, excellent. Your work is always in depth and most appreciated. So I think that's a really nice note to end on, a note of appreciation. <laughs> um, Harold, I really want to thank you for your time. Uh, Mandy you. And, and Foster, thank you for, for making sure that this happened. I'm thrilled that all of you are here and get to hear how fantastic Harold and his book are and that it's out in the world. I mean, yeah. we, in terms of... Uh, scent and aroma my own personal opinion is the real thing is so completely interesting apart you know aside from the marketing aside from the industry just the real stuff about smells is fascinating and Harold's made a major contribution to people being able to have that experience I'm very excited about that and then Priya just says thank you so much Harold and Mandy so amazing to have two authors whose work shaped me in the same room so all right, folks. Well, uh, let's end this on this lovely note. Uh, I, I wish you all the best. Tomorrow, everyone hang in there. It's almost oh, over. 
<laughs> it's almost over. We can't talk about it. Uh, and Harold, thank you for for ushering us into such an intense couple of days with with such uh, grace and charm and knowledge. Well, thank you, Saskia. It's been a great fun. Great fun. Yeah, and I can't wait to get that book in the mail. It's almost there. So. <laughs>